Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Well, welcome to Chickwalk Museum and Nature Center. And this is our first presentation for the season. And we have Teresa Marone here. Teresa, I'm just going to kind of read off my notes here because she has so much that she has accomplished. Um, she's the author of The Beginning of the Guide to Di Dehydrating Food in the Backcountry Kitchen, Camp Cooking for Canoeists, Hikers, and Anglers. She also has been the author of 18 other books. And I don't have enough hands <laughs> to hold up all her other books, but I do have a couple here. Uh, Common Backyard Weeds and Wild Berries and Fruits. She also has one on mushrooms. And Teresa's very knowledgeable of this because she has a cabin up here on Birch Lake. And so she has researched this area and these are very, very good books to have in your collection either in your cabin or if you're visiting up in this area. Well, and those are also, let me just jump in, those are regionally specific. Oh, great. This is weeds of the upper Midwest, and this is wild berries and fruits of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and I did this for three other regions of the country, and I did my mushroom book for a total of three regions of the country, including upper Midwest. And the, the berry one has a recipe book that goes along with it. Oh, there, is a, there is a companion yes. recipe book. Great. Yes, there's so yeah. many. Do we have it here? No, I don't think oh. we do. I, I don't think we have a cabin cookbook. Yeah, and so she has lots of books. Lots of books. Lots books, of books, books. books. <laughs> books. Okay, I could, yes. Books make great books. Yes, so you should get multiple copies, right? Yeah, yeah. right, right. <laughs> right. And also, as I, as I mentioned, you guys have taken numbers, and I'll be giving away from my own stock a copy of the dehydrating book from Story Publications, which is very, very thorough. And then I also have, we've got 16 copies of my Backcountry Kitchen, which is now out of print. I self-published this, and I'm, it needs revision, and I'm not going to do it. So I put it out of print, and we have 16 copies that we are giving away for a donation to Chipwalk of $5 or more. This is a $16 book. So if you want this book, and I must say it's got full dehydrating information and lots and lots of recipes that are designed for camping and backpacking and that kind of stuff, lightweight stuff, I'll be talking about that. But anyway, $5 donation or more over there. So that's what's going on with that. Well, I also do want to mention that Teresa is part of our Dark Sky Committee program here at Chiqua. And her photography is just fantastic. So she has some great dark sky photography. And so she's been helping us too here at Chickwalk with our committee. So I guess you're going to start. So, okay. Teresa Marone. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I'm going to do a little pass around and see if anybody knows what this is. It's the If you know, don't say anything. But just take a look at it and see if you can figure out what that is. And then I'll do something to it to rehydrate it so you can see what it is. So dehydrating is an age-old method of preserving food, making it more lightweight uh, and shelf-stable. Um, basically what you're doing is you're just drying it until literally the majority of the moisture is gone, almost all of it. And at that point it's shelf-stable and it shrinks up a lot. Um, and there are also, other reasons to dehydrate food for special diets. Some people do living and raw foods, and they dehydrate their food below a certain temperature, and that's still considered living or raw, and you can do that. Um, people that are on low-sodium diets find that the pre-packed, freeze-dried meals you get from the camping store or any of the other wonderful suppliers that sell them, they can be really high in sodium. And so if you can pack your own, you can sort of bypass that if you're careful about the ingredients you use. Also gluten-free. A lot of the pre-packs that you buy are not gluten-free. And you can pack your own that are, so that's very helpful as well. It's also kind of living up here on the trail, and you, really, you never know when the power is going to go or things are going to get weird up here. And I always keep some dehydrated food at the cabin just in case, kind of emergency supplies. And of course, camping. And a lot of this stuff, you're going to find you can buy like dried mushrooms at the grocery store. Dehydrating is way cheaper to do that on your own. You can buy 
some of these things dehydrated, but it is always going to be cheaper to do your own by the lot. Um, and as I mentioned, bone dried foods can also be sulfite free. I think I mentioned that. Like raisins, um, always, almost always have sulfite in them, which causes a lot of people a very bad allergic reaction. You can dry your own. So there's that going on for you too. And the other comment I'll make, and I don't mean to denigrate anybody that uses or makes um, freeze dried meal prepacks for camping, but that the little pouch you buy for 15 bucks and says it's going to feed two people, one person can slap that down in five minutes. So you can make bigger quantities, which is kind of a big deal. Okay, oh, geez, I yeah, so long the thing went to sleep. Oh, no. You can type, sorry, hold on. Oh, sure. <laughs> be that way. Yes, hello, really, that was it. Yes, I know. I'm going to steal my... There you go. All right, cool. Okay, so let's get on and talk about dehydrators, which is kind of the big thing. Now, I will see if this works now. And it didn't, so you get to advance the slide. Okay, um, when you're looking at a dehydrator, this is the one I use. I'm a, it's, I have more trays at home. I didn't bring them all. Mine is almost 30 years old. I has got one that's almost the same age. And this is a pretty typical outfit. Oh, you can go to the next slide. That's just my pretty slide. Um, there's two basic kinds of dehydrators you can buy. This is a dehydrator. This is an Excalibur. The heat and the fan are in the back of the machine, and the trays are square, and they pull out. Now, go to the next slide. This is the replacement for this model. It's the same manufacturer, but it looks quite a bit different. Um, and this is a stacking tray thing. The advantage to this, you can add as many trays as you want. You can say, I have four, five, six more at home. Um, and the heat, in my case, comes from the bottom up. And in that case, it comes from the top down. In the dehydrator you saw previously, the one that looks like a box, it's coming from the back, which is a little more efficient. But that one, the box one, is like 200 bucks. And you can't find that at a store. You have to order it. So you're basically ordering it without seeing it, which is kind of, eh, you know, I'm not real fond of that. These things, these stacking things, it's about 80 bucks right now. And you can get these at Walmart and Target and places like that. So these are pretty common. So there's kind of a decision you have to make about how much you're willing to put into it. Both types have, this is called a solid liner sheet. And if you're doing something like a, a fruit leather, which I've got some samples of here, you put it on this, because obviously it would run through the normal tray. And then you dehydrate it on that. And then we've also got screens like this that you can put things on that would shrink up a lot when they're dehydrated and they'll fall through the bigger trays. So you got that. Um, the dis another disadvantage to this round one is that it's kind of hard to stack foods in a round shape. The square trays are a lot easier, especially when you're doing things like leather. You kind of have to spread it around, but you can get over that. I've learned how to. Um, so, okay, let's see, next, there you go. Now that is, what is that bowl done that passing around? That bowl of weird stuff? Thank you, for. Oops. All right, did everybody have a chance to look at this? Anybody know what it is? Green beans. Green beans, who said green? Bingo. Okay, so I'm gonna put some hot water in this. Yeah, that is hot too. Ah, duh. All right, I'll just put this over here for a little bit. Let it stand. Put it on this so it doesn't burn the on the table. And then we'll look at that in a little bit. Okay, so this is, I've got a series of slides showing the food before I dried it and after I dried it. You can see how much space it loses. Um, Things like apples, which is what those are, um, 
they're a good example, they're a good thing to start with, but they're a good example of what you sometimes have to go through to dehydrate foods. With fruits, you want to peel them. Um, the peels will just get really tough and nasty. They also tend to have sprays or something on them that you don't want, so you're going to peel them anyway. Um, then you slice them. And of course, thinner pieces will dry more quickly. That's fairly obvious. Uh, you want to use a sharp knife when you're cutting these things to avoid bruising them because bruised fruit or vegetables won't dehydrate as well. And don't use a carbon steel knife on acid things. Apples are actually acidic because it could stain the fruit. Um, a mandoline, which is a sort of a, it's kind of hard to describe if you haven't seen one, but it's a, a plate about this long and it's got sharp blades that stick up and you drag them back and forth across and those are really good for that. Um, so anyway, you want to peel things and then a piece of dry more quickly, sharp knife. Okay, apples. With fruits like apples, which turn brown, as we all know, you have to do a preparation to a very quick preparation to prevent them from browning because they will brown when they're dehydrated if you don't do something to them. There's a couple things you can do. You can blanch them in steam or water. You can syrup blanch them for fruits. And I've got something I'll pass around here in a little bit that syrup blanch blueberries with Things like apples, potatoes, turnips, apricots, pears, bananas, and peaches, you can soak them in acidulated water, which is simply a quart of water with one to three cups of lemon juice. And that'll take care of the browning issues. And you can also use a sulfite solution, which you would get at the winemaking store. Now that is a problem for people with asthma. You wouldn't want to do that, but it is extremely efficient and effective. Um, it was traditionally done by burning sulfur and having the fruit or the vegetables on, on a tray over this pan of burning sulfur, which is a terrible, nauseous thing to do. We don't live that way anymore. So you can go to the winemaking store and buy sodium by metabisulfite. And you put a tablespoon of that with a quart of water and just dip the fruit. You can also soak them in pineapple or orange juice or spray with lemon juice. So that's things you can do with fruits and vegetables that will turn brown when they're dehydrated. Uh, you can dip them in powdered pectin. You can lightly dip them in honey, but they'll be very sticky. You can use a commercial fruit protector, such as Fruit Fresh, which is available at the store, and it's just a powder, shake it around. And then you can, with blueberries, I, you have to check the skin, which means make a whole or a break because blueberries, if you know this from, you might not know it, you might know it just because you have blueberries, but they have a waxy coating on the skin, and a lot of fruits do. And you can break that, it's called checking, by syrup blanching, steam blanching, or freezing them, and then taking the already frozen, still frozen fruit, putting it in a colander, and running hot water on it, and the skins will split. So that's another way to do it. I'm going to pass this little thing around. This is some blueberries that I syrup blanched. I've got a little spoon. You're welcome to take a couple off and try them. When you syrup blanch blueberries, they're very raisiny in their texture. They're very soft. If you don't syrup blanch them, they'll be more like kind of dry and hard. So the syrup blanching is a nice thing to do, but they take forever to dry when you can syrup blanch them. Okay, let's go to the next slide. That's bananas, and that browning in the bananas, these were treated with, I think, lemon juice or something like that, but bananas still kind of turn brown in the middle. If they weren't treated, the whole darn thing would be brown. That's just the way that it is. Okay, next slide. These are beans, and when you're camping, you would never have time to take dried beans, you know, pinto beans or something like that, and cook them. I mean, you, you just can't cook them on a campsite that long. But you can cook your beans and then dehydrate them. You can buy canned beans and rinse them and dehydrate them. And they kind of pop, as you can see, and they rehydrate in like five minutes. So if you're making something like a chili or something when you're at camp, you just do what I just said with the beans, dry cooked beans and they just rehydrate along with all your other ingredients, which is a pretty slick trick. 
Um, all right, next slide. Now these are grapes, and this is the thing on the right is about as close as you're going to get to raisins. They're not whole, as you can see, because again, you have to check the skins, which you can do, but it's, unless you're working with seedless grapes, you're gonna to wanna to get the seeds out too. So you cut them in half, flip the seeds out with a knife, and then dry them. And that's, you, if you wanna dry whole grapes that are seedless, you can steam or water blanch them for 60 seconds. Just steam them for 60 seconds or water blanch them which means just putting them in boiling water for 60 seconds and then drying them out. Again, the skins will split. So if you don't do that, they'll never dry. Okay, next one. There's the green beans that I was just passing around. And <coughs> that, the slide on the left is exactly what I did. I mean, that's, that's the same tray. You would never believe that that many green beans go down to that amount, but they do. Yeah, so it's really a lot. Um, and those dry really fast. When you're, that's another thing to mention, if you're dehydrating purchased frozen fruit or vegetables, you don't have to pre-treat it at all because it's already been done. Um, things that are frozen have to be, uh, they have to be prepared before you freeze, usually by blanching because otherwise there's enzymes in the fruit and the vegetables that will continue to deteriorate in the the fruit and the vegetables will get kind of funky. So that's why we always, before we freeze green beans or anything that we're going to freeze, we steam blanch them or throw them in boiling water for 60 seconds or something and then quick cool them and freeze them. Anybody that's done much freezing knows what I'm talking about. If you don't do that, if you just take your green beans and you freeze them without blanching or doing some other kind of pre-treatment and you freeze them, they'll get kind of grayish and funky after a while in the freezer. So anything, if you buy frozen French cut green beans, like shown in that picture on the left, you just dump them on the tray and dehydrate them. <laughs> anything that's frozen can be dehydrated without other treatment, which is kind of nice. Okay, um, let's go another slide. Here's something that's really nice um, when you're out camping and you want to make a soup or something like that. This is just frozen mixed vegetables. Again, I just dumped them on the tray with one of these liners on there, one of those mesh liners, because they get really small and they would fall through the regular tray. But you dry them and then you can make soups and stews and all kinds of things like that with those dried frozen vegetables. And it doesn't take very much time and that's pretty nice to be able to do for, for camping. Okay, next slide. Tomatoes are Dehydrated tomatoes are different than sun-dried tomatoes. Sun-dried tomatoes are usually quite dark and have a more intense, almost burned, burned isn't the right flavor, but they have a very intense flavor. Dried tomatoes are just that, they're dried tomatoes. You can slice them, you can dice them, you can do whatever you want. If you want to dry little cherry tomatoes or pear tomatoes, you have to either cut them in half, or check the skins because that's another one that has a big skin and it'll never dry if you don't do something to break it or cut in half. Sliced tomatoes work really nice and you can, it'll never be like a fresh tomato when you rehydrate them, but they're really good for cooking. And diced tomatoes, when you dehydrate them, are just fabulous in chili mixes and stuff that you're gonna have to take to camp. Really good for that. Um, and if you are drying cherry or plum tomatoes that you cut in half, you know, you're gonna have a half of a tomato and it's got the wet side and the dry side. You put them on the dehydrator, try with the tray with the wet side up, dehydrate them until they're kind of sort of starting to shrink and looking a little bit like something's going on. And then you take them and pop them with your finger to kind of open them up to expose more of the inside so it dries more quickly. It saves you quite a bit of, quite a bit of time. Okay, once you've dehydrated something, well, I'll pass, I'm gonna pass this around just for fun. This is stuff, this is fruit leather, which I guess I didn't make a slide for, so I'll just talk about it. Fruit leathers are, everybody knows what fruit leather is, I assume. Mm -hmm. And you can do it with vegetables. Oh, you don't, Tom? Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're <coughs> I, I don't know what to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, 
so, well, then you'll get a chance to try a fruit leather because what a fruit leather is, is it's pureed fruit and cooked pureed fruit, usually cooked. And you dry it, you put it on a solid, one of these solid sheets. This is you can't just put right on the tray. You have to have a solid sheet and you might have to, you might want to spray it with like a nonstick spray. The other thing you can do if you've got a square tray dehydrator, you can cut a piece of kitchen parchment to fit your tray. And you don't have to do anything because the, the leather, the, when the leather is dry, it's kind of sticky. You'll see that when I pass it, pass it around. But if you put it on parchment before you put the, the puree onto the, uh, the parchment paper, it doesn't stick to the parchment paper even when it's dry. So if you have a round dehydrator like I do, you can cut a piece of parchment paper like this and put it on your tray. And then you put like, the leather I'm going to pass around is literally just applesauce and I dumped a can of mango baby food in it, just for a little bit different flavor, but it's basically just applesauce. Mm -hmm. And with a round dehydrator, you kind of have to pour it around, spread it out, you want it to be thinner in the middle because the edges of the dehydrator dry more quickly than the middle. And so you want the puree to be about a quarter of an inch thick around the edges and an eighth of an inch thick in the middle. So you kind of spread it around. And this is where round dehydrators have a distinct disadvantage over square ones because it's really easy to just spread that stuff out onto a square dehydrator tray. You don't have this stupid hole in the middle. Um, so I'll pass this around. You can also, when you're making leathers, you can, instead of making a big sheet, you can do little blobs of them and make fun-sized individual leathers like these. And, wait, there's more. You can also, I'm not going to pass these around because I don't want anybody to eat them. You can dehydrate things like, this is salsa, prepared salsa. Okay, and so you do the same thing, you just make a little blob of it, dehydrate it, and then you can bring this camping and rehydrate it. This was about a tablespoon and a half of salsa. And it just packs up, you know, put it in some wax paper and pack it. And then when you're camping, you can rehydrate this and you've got salsa. It's a pretty slick trick. In the same way, this is about a tablespoon and a half, maybe two tablespoons of barbecue sauce. A little barbecue sauce leather. Again, dry it, pack it, take it out to the B-dub and rehydrate it and you've got barbecue sauce. This is ketchup. Same thing. So you can, you can also make, like if you do Asian cooking, you can take like a sauce for say kung pao, which has bean paste and hoisin and chopped up garlic and a bunch of stuff in it. Make that sauce and it's kind of ketchupy in its consistency and you can dehydrate little blobs of that. And then when you're camping, you can make kung pao chicken. I've done it, out in the boundary waters, it's amazing. So I will pass this around. Everybody can take, I think we've got enough of this that everybody can take a piece of the, this is the apple leather with a little bit of mango in it. And this, this is another one. I'm gonna let you guys guess and see if you can figure out what that is. It's a fruit, that's all I'll say. Emily, you better take a piece of this before it goes around. See if you know what this, maybe you've done this. There's a fork if you wanna lift something up so people aren't worried about it. Hygiene. Um, okay, so the other thing you have to do after you dehydrate something, if you've got, you know, your dried blueberries or that dried mixed vegetables or whatever it is, not leathers, but dried fruits and vegetables that are in pieces, you have to do what's called conditioning because it's possible that the dehydrating has gone a little bit unevenly and some pieces may be really dry and some pieces may still have a little bit of moisture in them, but it's hard to tell. And when you're dehydrated, what do you think, Tom? First experience with a fruit leather. Isn't that fun? Well. Yeah, I know, they're pretty good. Um, when you're dehydrating foods, especially things that take a long time to dry, Always take a couple pieces out, cool them to room temperature before you judge their doneness. Because when they're still hot in the dehydrator, they feel softer. It's just the way that it is. 
And so if you take them out, cool them to room temperature, then you can tell if it's done. And if you think it's done, then you can take the whole batch out. And if it's not done, you put it back and you dehydrate it some more and, until you get to where you want. Once your stuff is dehydrated, not leathers, but pieces of fruits and vegetables, take the whole batch, cool it, and put it in like a one quart jar, like a canning jar, cover it, put it in a dark place for three days and let it sit and check and see if there's any kind of moisture showing up on the inside. Check it daily because if there is moisture, you need to get it back into the dehydrator. What this is doing is it's conditioning so that if there are some pieces that are a little bit drier than other pieces, they will absorb some of the moisture from the pieces that are a little bit still moist. And so they even out, that's called conditioning. Very good idea to do when you do a big batch of sliced apples or something like that. Um, and it's, like I say, if you see any moisture showing up, it looks, the, the glass looks cloudy or hazy, that means there's still too much moisture, throw it back in the dehydrator and give it another couple hours and try it again. Very important to, to try and do that. If you sun dry foods, which you can do, and this book talks about doing it. Now, I don't recommend sun drying in Minnesota because we usually don't have enough reliable <coughs> sun that's dry. And it's humid like this, don't even try it. But there is information in here on sun drying. And basically, you make trays, set your prepared food out, put cheesecloth over them, and put them outside in the sun for days. And you turn them every day, and you take them in at night, and then you put it back out the next day. And in the meantime, you don't know what bugs have done to that stuff. They might have been in there laying eggs or something like that. It's gross, but it's the truth. So if you do do sun drying, you have to pasteurize anything that you sun dry. But I, I wrote this down because it's not something I do. Spread it on a baking sheet in a loose layer and heat it at 175 in the oven for 15 minutes. And then let it cool and pack. And you do that to make sure that there's not going to be an unpleasant surprise when you unpackage it. You can also, by the way, I didn't mention this, but you can dehydrate in a home oven. It is extremely inefficient, very irritating to do in the summer because you've got your oven going for hours, but you can do it. Uh, if you're dehydrating in the winter, it's a little bit better, but it's, it's not efficient, but it does work. You have to dehydrate at a low temperature Usually the dehydrating we're doing in this thing is at about 135 for fruits and vegetables. Meats are 145. Herbs and tender things like that are at 125. So you've got to have your oven at the lowest setting, which is usually 150. Then you have to prop open the door. Then you have to put your food on a cake cooling rack with a screen on it or something. And then you have to prop up a fan blowing into the oven because you can't dehydrate without blowing air. If you're just blowing heat, it's, it's really inefficient. It doesn't work very well. And if anybody ever tries to sell you a dehydrator that does not have a fan, forget about it. There are such things out there, but they have to have fans. So don't, don't ever buy one without a fan. Anyway, if you want to dehydrate in your oven, you can do it. You'll hate yourself if you do it. But you can try it. Um, once your food is dried and conditioned, how do you store it? Well, the best way is vacuum packing. That's, there's no doubt about it, that's the best way. We don't all have vacuum packers, but if you do have one, that's the absolute best way to do it. Just put your dried conditioned food in there, vacuum it, and then I store that in the freezer still. It doesn't have to be, it's shelf stable, it could probably stay two years, but for better safety and better food quality, I throw it in the freezer because I've got a big chest freezer. You will find if you store dried food or anything like that where it has sunlight on it, it will start to lose its color. So even if you're not storing it in the freezer, store it in a dark closet somewhere, keep it out of the light for longer storage. Now, of course, when you're camping, that's, that's immaterial. But if you make a batch of stuff when the fruits or uh, vegetables are available when they're in season, the best way to preserve it is to put it in a dehydrator. I mean, uh, excuse me, back in senior, senior. But if you don't have that, you can store them in just glass jars, um, thick plastic bags, roll them up, throw that in the freezer. That works pretty good. Uh, one thing to say about vacuum sealing is that 
the organism that causes botulism, which is Clostridium botulinum, grows in oxygen-free environments, but it requires low acid, low acid conditions and adequate moisture. So it's unlikely to happen with dehydrated foods, but it is a very slim possibility if you vacuum pack your dehydrated foods and they're not properly <coughs> dehydrated and they're low acid, very, very slight chance. I just mentioned this to scare everybody half to death. <laughs> That's my job. Um, okay, so let's get to the fun part. When you're trying to pack your own foods, oh, here, I should look at these green beans, by the way. There they are. All rehydrated, look at that. Mm -hmm. That little bowl of weird looking things, this is, this is what it looks for. This is how many there are. So, can you pass it around? Sure, absolutely. And you saw what that looked like before. It didn't look like anything. Okay, so when you come around to packing your own foods, next slide. Do it. Okay. Now you've got dehydrated food. You can also use if you want meats. You can dehydrate meats. It's kind of hard to do. They don't come out that well. You can do it, but they're pretty tough. They're pretty hard. Think of jerky. That's kind of what you're doing is you're turning chicken into jerky. You can also buy things like this, little pouches of chicken or tuna or whatever, and just bring this with you. These are legal in the VW. Whether or not it's wise to open a pack of tuna that's like this in the VW, I would say that it's probably not, but these are legal. Um, and so instead of putting this into a pre-pack, you would just bring this along with your dried vegetables and all that stuff, and that's ready to go. Another option for that is to buy uh, imitation chicken and beef and things like that, which is something that you will sometimes find, oh, goodness, mosquito, at um, health food stores, co-ops, things like that, and it's made out of grains. There's a great version of that which is probably the easiest to find, and it's called um, textured vegetable protein or TVP. You can buy that at Whole Foods. You can find that, of course, Amazon has everything. Um, they have it. Um, the TVP. I thought I wrote down the. I thought I wrote down the manufacturer's Mountain House makes a TVP. There's a couple versions of it. You just Google uh, textured vegetable protein and you'll find it, or just go to Amazon. And it's made out of soy. And it comes in both granules, that is like ground beef when it's rehydrated, or it comes in chunks. I don't know how else to say it. And they're like cut up chicken, except it's made out of soy. But those are really good in meals you pack for yourself to take to the beat up because it's, it's kind of meat like it's. It's protein, it's packed with protein. As long as you don't have a soy allergy, it works really well. So that's an option. The other thing you can do, if you want to make a pre-packed meal that involves meat, you can buy freeze-dried meat, commercially freeze-dried meat. You used to be able to buy it at like REI and camping stores like that in little pouches like this, except it would be filled with freeze-dried chicken or freeze-dried beef. I haven't seen that at REI for years, and I Googled it, went to REI's website, they don't seem to have it anymore, but you can buy number 10 cans of actual freeze-dried chicken for about $45. Now that's got 50 servings in that can. So it's, no, it's, excuse me, the can has 25 servings in it, so that's $2 a serving for freeze-dried chicken. And it rehydrates along with everything else. That's a pretty good solution. And again, Mountain House is one that does that. Um, I can't remember the name of the other place that does it. <laughs> I don't know why I have notes on that, I can't find it. Um, but you can, you can look for that, and again, they're on Amazon. And if you get that 10 pound, or that number 10 can of freeze-dried chicken or freeze-dried beef or whatever, you just scoop a quarter of a cup per serving into the mix you're going to be packing, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that's a quarter cup per serving is about what you'd use for a, a pre-packed mix. Cover the, you know, reseal the can and put it in the freezer. Keep it in the freezer. 
and it'll last forever. So that's a, that's a pretty good option. And if you think about paying $15 for a you know, pre-packed camping meal or fettuccine Alfredo with chicken, you're going to pay $15 for that. You can make that for about four, even if you're paying for freeze-dried chicken. It's pretty easy. And that's what we're talking about. So when I pack foods, now this is, okay, that is carrot, apple, raisin salad, which is really good. It's kind of a side dish. Yeah. Um, that is made with 2 thirds cup dried julienne carrots. Julienne is basically matchsticks. You can cut them yourself by hand. You can cut them on a mandolin. You can go to the store and buy matchstick carrots in the grocery aisle, in the produce aisle. And that's just blanch them, steam blanch them briefly and dehydrate them. And this has also got um, dried apple slices, raisins, and then it's got a little dressing mix. Now what I do when I'm doing something like this, this is a pretty simple example, but this is a good, this is a good way to get into it. The, this bag, this Ziploc bag, and I'll talk about that in a minute, it has the, the dried carrots, the dried apple slices, and the raisins in it. And then this little bag here is the sauce mix. And it's got two teaspoons powdered blue cheese dressing, which you can find dry in the aisle with dried cookies and all that kind of stuff. Powdered blue cheese dressing and two teaspoons non-fat dried milk powder. And so what I do is I put that stuff, which I want to keep separate from the vegetables that need rehydrating. This stuff doesn't. So you put it in a little tiny bag and put that little bag inside of the big bag with the, with the other stuff. And then you seal it. And when you're at camp, that bag you can put it into a bowl and pour boiling water right into that bag if it is Ziploc brand. And I'm not affiliated with Ziploc. There have been studies done on it. And Ziploc brand bags can withstand boiling water. They don't emit uh, noxious chemicals, which a lot of other bags do. I would not try this with anything other than genuine Ziploc bags. And I think that the freezer weight bags are a little bit safer but you can do this with just a standard, regular weight, zipper top, ziplock bag. And so you put, support the bag in a little bowl, pour boiling water in it, let it rehydrate, drain the water out into a saucepan or something, and you can use that to make a soup or drink it or whatever you want to do, do something else with it. And then you mix the dressing mix in, and that's how you do a simple dish like that. I write the instructions, you know, how, to, how much water, how much soaking time it needs. It needs soak for 20 minutes. So you can, you can actually read that. Um, then you make the sauce with a little bit, a quarter cup of water. You drain the, the carrots and the apples. And then you mix the dressing in and you're ready to eat. So that's a simple kind of mix that you can make. Um, Let's see what slide 13 is. Let's do another simple one. Go ahead to slide 13, the next slide. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, this is beets and carrots and lemon thyme sauce. And again, this is, all right, I've just got a cup of dried julienne beets. Now, julienne is that matchstick thing we talked about, and I used fresh beets, sliced them, cut them crosswise into julienne strips, blanched them, and dehydrated them. And then this has got a half cup dry julienne carrots. Again, you can buy carrot match sticks at the store and dry them. And then there's a little bag that goes with this, a little tiny bag. And this has got one teaspoon of powdered lemonade mix, not sugar free, but powdered lemonade mix. I use country time. It's got half teaspoon of cornstarch, a little bit of butter buds, which is dried butter and some crumbled dried thyme leaves, and a pinch each of powdered ginger and black pepper. And again, it's the same as the other thing. You, in this case, I didn't rehydrate it in the bag because I wanted the liquid. I put it into a little, one of my little camping pots, put some water in it, heated it, let it soak for 20 minutes, and then mixed the sauce in. So it's, this is a matter of thinking about 
a different way of cooking. You know, you're going to be working with dried stuff, which is very lightweight and pack, shelf stable. It's not going to go funky on you. But you have to think about what would I like to make out there. Well, I can dry these beets and carrots and make a nice little lemony sauce. This is how to do it. Um, so you kind of have to either buy a book that has lots of recipes in it, like my backcountry kitchen. <laughs> Um, and that's what Back Country Kitchen, that little yellow book that we're doing for five dollars for a donation, that's filled with these kinds of recipes. There's probably a hundred of them in there. Um, the other recipe on this same page is Minnesota green bean casserole, which is the famous, everybody's had it every Thanksgiving for most of their lives, right? That one. And for that, again, think about making this at home and think about how you do it with dry foods. So, what I have in that is two thirds, that's not picture. I have two thirds cup of dried French cut green beans, which is those little squirrely things that I passed around. I have two tablespoons of dried, broken up mushroom slices, as a green bean casserole always has mushrooms on it, right? And I've got a teaspoon of dried chopped onion, which I dehydrated. And then I have a little sauce mix. And that's got a package, you know, a powder, like, like with the powder gravies a package of white cream sauce mix, I use an R brand, two tablespoons of sliced almonds, and two tablespoons non-fat dry milk powder. Again, put that in a little bag, put that in a big bag with the, with the dry vegetables, and then at camp, you just boil some water, add the vegetables, cover and let stand for 10 minutes, then you stir in the sauce ingredients, return it to boiling, reduce heat, simmer for two minutes, and top with some french fried onions, which you have carried separately. And you'd be surprised how good that is when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Okay, next slide. Another thing you can do, this is dried hummus. Oh, you can't see the top of it, but that's what it says. It says that it's hummus. And you can make your own hummus, or you can dehydrate purchased hummus. Hummus is a Mideastern spread made of garbanzo beans. It's got garlic and olive oil and tahini and all kinds of things like that in it. And when you make that, it's the same kind of procedure as making the leather. You put it on a solid liner sheet, and you start dehydrating it, and you start stirring it and breaking it up as it dries. And as it continues to dry, you break it up and crumble it some more, and you keep on going until the whole thing is just sort of a crumbly mix, like you can see in the photo at the top. It looks like, I don't know what that looks like, but that's what it's, you know, that's what textured vegetable protein looks like. It looks like that. And then at camp, you just boil three quarters of, wa of water, three quarters cup of water. You add that dried stuff, stir it, and mix it up. Let it stand until cool, and you're done. And you've got hummus at camp. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, let's have another slide to give you some more ideas. This is chicken fried rice rice with mushrooms and sausage, and chicken chili. All of these are things you can buy from the camping store or from Outfitters for $15 for a little bag that's supposed to serve two people, and you can make them for about a dollar and a half for the most part. Or two bucks if you use the chicken fried rice, because that's got dehydrated and free fried chicken in it. And again, it's the same thing, where you're using ingredients, the same ingredients you use at home, except they're all dried and you kind of have to combine them a little bit differently. So for this, we've got a cup of instant rice. Now normally, I don't use instant rice, but when you're doing this kind of stuff, when you're bringing things that you're rehydrating in a short amount of time, instant rice is a pretty good thing to use. And then this has got an ounce of freeze-dried diced chicken. It's got three tablespoons of dried sliced green onion, which you have dried. Three <coughs> tablespoons freeze-dried, or personally dried green peas. Two teaspoons sliced almonds a heaping tablespoon dried shredded carrot, which ends up looking like that green stuff I passed around when it's shredded, when you dry shredded carrots, it just turn into nothing. But they rehydrate and look just like shredded carrots. And then it's got garlic chips and a little bag with some beef bouillon granules and some five spice powder. And then you carry separately some oil for frying and a little packet of soy sauce if you can snag one from a Chinese restaurant. And you rehydrate the stuff pan fry it in a skillet for a little bit and serve it with the soy sauce and it's it's really pretty amazing. I will also take this time to mention 
ghee, which is clarified butter. You can make it yourself. It takes a little bit of work, but you can do it. You can also buy it like this. This is shelf-stable butter. It's kind of, it's the consistency of shortening. This has never been refrigerated. This has been in my cupboard at home for over a year. It does not need refrigeration. So you can bring this with you to the boundary waters, use a plastic container like this that has a screw on the lid. Do not put this in something that could pop open because if it opens up and it's hot and it gets runny, you will hate yourself forever. So <laughs> put some of this, you know, scoop it into this, put it in a thing like this, put this in two plastic Ziploc bags just as protection and you can be out there for three months and this will not go rancid. It's amazing stuff. This is used extensively in Indian cooking. It also can be used at very high cooking temperatures. It does not burn, which butter does burn. So if you want to make your own ghee, you can buy it, but you can make your own. And what you do is you melt a pound of butter, whatever you want to do, and then you skim off from the top any of the white stuff from the top. It's kind of, it's milk solids is what it is. You skim that off the top and then you carefully pour the yellow liquid into a glass container and there will be some more white stuff settled out of the bottom. You don't use that. You can use that to season vegetables that you're cooking at home. Not, this is not for camping, but you can use that residue. It's buttery and it's salty. Um, and then so you've got this clear yellow liquid. Put that in a jar, let it stand, and if it settles and there's any more white stuff on top, scrape that off, then remelt it and put it into a storage container. And that's ghee, that's the same thing that this is. And you can carry that for months. You can put it in your cupboard for months and it will not get rancid. It's the strangest stuff. So anyway, um, the other recipes shown there, rice, and these are pages out of the backcountry kitchen, as I mentioned. Rice with mushrooms and sausage. Again, you can buy this in a pre-pack, or you can make it yourself. This one I'm using real rice, because it's going to cook a little longer. This has got a cup of converted or long grain rice, a quarter cup dried, cooked, crumbled bulk sausage. You can dry sausage, ground beef, that kind of thing. You cook it, break it up, get as much fat off of it as you can, Put it on a solid liner sheet and dry it. And then once it's dry and crumbled, dry it at 145 high temperature. Once it's dried and crumbled, put it in a bag or a bowl or something with a bunch of paper towels and let any fat that remains in it kind of attract itself to the paper towels. It's basically you're trying to get as much fat out as possible. That stuff doesn't keep as long as dehydrated vegetables because it's meat but you'd still be okay for like a two week trip camping with home dried crumbled sausage or ground beef. You can do that. Or you can use that textured vegetable protein and just forget about the whole thing. But uh, anyway, so for the rice with mushrooms and sausage, we've got a cup of long grain rice, a quarter cup dried cooked crumbled bulk sausage, a half cup, quarter cup, excuse me, dried mushroom slices, a tablespoon of dried onion flakes, a tablespoon of butter buds, which is granular dried butter, a half teaspoon of salt, a little bit of sage. And here, you put it all, you boil two cups of water in that can, and you add everything. You cover it, let it stand about 15 minutes. You're rehydrating the sausage and the rice. Both of those take a fair amount of rehydrating, because they're, they're pretty hard. So you stir that well, return to boiling, reduce heat, and stir frequently cooking until the rice is tender and most of the liquid is absorbed about 15 minutes. Remove from heat, let, let stand, cover five minutes, and fluff. And that's, just, that's really pretty good stuff for when you're out in the middle of nowhere. And by making it yourself, that probably costs three bucks or something to make, not 15. And this, this is easily two or three decent ser serving sizes. Um, chicken chili, same kind of thing. I'm using freeze-dried chicken slices. I've got a third of a cup of lentils, dried lentils, which rehydrate fairly quickly. Uh, some long grain rice, some dried diced green bell pepper, some dried onion, chili powder blend, vegetable bouillon granules, garlic chips, and oregano. Same kind of deal. 
put it into a pan with some boiling water, stir it around, let it stand for a while to rehydrate the rice, come back and finish cooking it, and you've got chicken chili. And chicken chili is one of those things you see all the time on packaged uh, meal packs to, you know, that you can buy at the store. Okay, slide 16. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, that's it. Yep. Sorry. Hello. Okay. Okay, so that's got chili mac, and that's it's a very similar thing. Again, think about how you make chili mac at home, and think about how to do it in one pot. In the bottom, and it's got this one. This mix has a cup of dried macaroni, a third cup of dried diced tomatoes, a quarter cup dried pinto beans. This is the ones where the, you have. We, uh, you have dehydrated canned or cooked beans and they kind of blow up or they rehydrate really fast. It's got three tablespoons of non-fat dried milk powder. It's got freeze-dried corn, optional. Uh, diced green bell pepper dehydrated. Some two teaspoons of chili powder blend. A teaspoon of dried chopped onions. A te quarter teaspoon of three quarter teaspoon of celery salt. A half teaspoon of cornstarch. Corn a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder, a quarter teaspoon of sugar, and half the leather from an eight ounce can of tomato sauce. It's gonna be a thing like this. You take an eight ounce can of tomato sauce, spread it out on one of these, make the leather, just like that stuff I passed around, and it's shelf stable. And you, for this particular recipe, you just cut it in half and you take half of it, and it goes into your chili mac, and that's how you get your tomato sauce in your chili mac. Um, Ramen um, cabbage salad is dried um, sliced cabbage, which is very easy to dry. Um, it dries really, really fast. And it's got dried green cabbage, dried red cabbage, dried green onion pieces, a package of freeze-dried diced chicken, and then you take a package of ramen noodles, break that in half, and take half of that and take half of the seasoning and some almond slices and some sesame, you put that in another bag, and then you mix in a small bottle and carry it separately, some red wine vinegar, some peanut oil, some sugar, sesame oil, and soy sauce. And basically, you're, you cook the ramen noodles and throw in the cabbage and let that all stand, and then you're mixing it with this, this dressing. And, no, actually, you don't cook the ramen, I forgot about that. This is one of those where you don't cook the ramen, it just gets softened by the wet cabbage. That's really quite good. Um, yeah, so that's another another sort of... There's a lot of things in this book that are not weird, but they're not real common either. And I make this ramen salad a lot with dried ramen noodles that aren't cooked. They're just crumbled in with a salad, and they kind of they rehydrate a little bit, but they're still kind of firm, and that's kind of part of the fun of them. So, um, another note I will make real quick. I mentioned that some of these recipes have oil in them. If you're going to take oil out into the boundary waters or anywhere you're camping, get yourself a Nalgene bottle. Uh, I forgot to bring mine. It's a screw top bottle. You can get them at the camping store. It's brand name. And you can put your oil in that. It's screw, the screw top is really, really good. Very solid. You can put, I think they, they probably a pint is what you want to take. Put that in a couple of bags, Ziploc bags, just in case it gets bounced around and breaks open, because otherwise you'll hate yourself forever. Um, so that's, that's the way that you carry oil when you're out with the sticks. You can also use, if you don't want to rehydrate or dehydrate your own potatoes, you can buy stuff like this, which is just Betty Crocker dried potatoes. And there's nice dried potato slices in here. You can also buy dried hash browns in the same, you know, this is just in the box dinner mix at the grocery store. And you can buy dried hash browns, and they're a third the price of buying dried hash browns from our yacht. It's the same stuff. You just rehydrate them and then you can fry them. And there's a little sauce mix in here, which is, in this case, it's a sort of a rich, creamy cheese sauce. And you can use that to make something else, a different recipe. You know, think about what you might do with that. Or you could make all ground potatoes out in the boundary waters if you want to. 
So that's kind of, oh, one more thing. I forgot to mention this. When you're dehydrating things, you can stack up a million trays if you want, and I always do. But don't dehydrate something like diced onions at the same time that you're doing fruit. Bad idea, <laughs> because the onions are really powerful and your fruit is going to taste like onions. So kind of keep fruits and, and mild vegetables together and then save the onions and garlic and that kind of stuff for a separate batch. Um, that's a tip learned from experience. So, any questions? Yes, Kirsten. What was that fruit? Which fruit? The pink fruit that he has. What does anybody think? Yeah, or distributed. One more. Watermelon? <coughs> you got it. It was watermelon. Isn't that something? I know. It's like it's a it's like a if you that one was dehydrated. I did that a couple of days ago. And I dehydrated it until it was almost kind of crispy. If you dehydrate a little bit less time, it comes out like taffy. Then it's kind of, but it that's not as um, you wouldn't want to take that out for very long because it's still got a lot of moisture in it. But it's really neat to give the kids just love this mm -hmm. stuff. It's like, what is this stuff? It's like watermelon taffy. It's kind of cool. Yeah, so that was that's what that was. Therese, how do you really know when you've done it right? I mean, the watermelon? Just, no, uh, anything. It really gets crispy, or is it just like, that's a good you feel question. Dry? That's a good, it depends on what it is. If it's something like grapes, and you're, you know, you're cutting up grapes and you want to make something like raisins, or those blueberries that I passed around, mm -hmm. believe me, when they're not properly dried, you will know it, because if you squeeze them, they feel wet. So with the blueberries, I just kept on drying them until they felt like raisins. And when you're doing a thing like that, you've got a whole tray full of blueberries, some are going to dry faster than others, especially the ones around the edge. So you periodically open it up, pick out the ones that are dry, put them out, and then redistribute the rest and continue drying. Um, any decent book on dehydrating, mine or any other one, will tell you what a doneness test is. Like with a fruit leather, it shouldn't be sticky. With the watermelon slices, it should be bendable, but you know, when I kind of rehydrate it or dehydrate it a little longer than I usually do, um, a lot of things, it's like like dried apples, they aren't crisp, they kind of bend, but they don't feel wet anymore. And like I say, any book will tell you the doneness test for them, because um, everything's different. So that's, that's a good question though. If you dry for things like um, that dried mixed vegetable thing, those feel like bullets. I mean, those are really dry when they're dry. That's how hard you have to drive those. So, other questions? Can, can you dry green tomatoes because mine never turn red? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. Yeah. Yeah, you can dry green tomatoes. Um, they're a little bit different than drying red tomatoes because they're not as sweet and they don't have as much water. So they dry more quickly, actually. Uh, and they'll tend to be Whereas a dried tomato, a red tomato that's ripe and nice will be a little bit flexible, a little bit nice like that, and a dried green tomato is going to be a little bit less bendy uh, because they just don't have as much water in them. Um, but yeah, you can dry green tomatoes. And you can chop them up and make a puree and dry that, and then make chicken mole or something. You know, there's all green tomatoes are kind of interesting to work with. So, other questions? All right, well, I will do the drawing for the book, and then I also have sort of a, this is three jars of blueberries from when I syrup blanched those blueberries a couple days ago. Syrup blanching um, is to cook in a sugar mixture, and in this case, I was trying to break the skins of the blueberries so that they dry. They still take forever to dry. I had that dehydrator run for two days on those blueberries. Syrup blanching things makes them dry really slow. But what I did is I made a mixture of one cup of corn syrup, one cup of white sugar, two cups of water, and I boiled that and stirred it until the sugar was all dissolved. And then I put a full pint of fresh blueberries in it, and I cooked that at a simmer, not at a boil, but at a simmer for like two minutes, and I could see the skins popping. I 
the seam is splitting, which is what I wanted. But of course, when the skin split, you get a bunch of blueberry flavor in the syrup. And that's what this is. This is the syrup that was used to syrup blanch those blueberries that I passed around. Now, it's not a thick syrup. You can see that it's, it's a thinner syrup. You're, whoever gets these, you're welcome to boil it down some more. Um, or you can use it in like malts or shakes or on top of ice cream. It's kind of, it's just, it's almost like putting the liquor on top of a little scoop of ice cream like they do at Trail Center with their sundaes. They have boozy sundaes, I think they call them. So anyway, for, I will draw for the free copy of the dehydrating book that I wrote. This was an interesting book because I wrote the original book, I wrote it for Story Publications, which is a big publisher. And they originally published it as a two-color book with what I would say were minimally, minimally acceptable or unacceptable illustrations that weren't very nice. And that sold better than they thought it would. And so after that was out for a couple of years, they decided to really give it the full recipe for treatment. And they took pictures and really threw the money at this. And this came out right when COVID hit. And so people were stuck in their houses, and they were looking for things to do, and they were also looking, thinking survival and thinking all of these things. And this thing, they couldn't keep it in print, it flew off the shelves. It really sold well. So this has been, it's been translated into German, Polish, and Chinese. <laughs> you can believe it. I can't read the Chinese one at all. And my name is in there too. It's like, what? <laughs> but anyway. So I will draw for the, the main draw, we'll get this book for free, that's a gift from me. And then the next three will each get a jar of blueberry syrup. This is sealed. You can see that the top is down. I, I sterilize these jars, put the boiling syrup in, and put a new lid on and cap it, and they, they pop down. So I didn't have the water bath, and they just sealed from it. So where's the numbers? Yay! Okay. Yeah. Oh, please. Okay. So, for the book. Oh, geez. Is that a six or is that a nine? <laughs> I'm sure it's a six. Who's got six? Oh, yay, Sharon. All right. Good for you. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoy it. Oh, thank you, Teresa. That's very best. You bet. All right. And the consolation prizes, the blueberry syrup. Fourteen. Says I. Says you. Okay, hey, Tom. All right. One jar of runny blueberry syrup. Love it. it tastes Thank very you. good. It's just not real thick. And eight. 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 Going once. Eight going wasn't going. picked. Eight wasn't picked. Oh. Oh. Well. That's fine then. Twelve. All right. Here you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And three. Burke. Okay. All right. All right. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you won something. <laughs> Did you bring an ice cream over to our legs? It's coming. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, chuck it. Okay. All right. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think that would make a very interesting mix. I really do. I, I make a blueberry martini kind of thing. I mean, you got it going on right now. If that's what you're talking about. It's already gone through. Yeah, that's right. It's already five five steps ahead of you. Well, thanks for your attention, and I hope you learned something. Well, they